Digital medicine is in a trough. We've talked about the hype curve ad nauseum. Uh, what is happening at conferences like this, and I am not saying it's a you thing, it's a we thing, I suffer from this as well, is that we hear about a new science and all of our big brains start to extrapolate going, oh my gosh, I can't wait to talk to this guy about that thing that I just learned so I can repair this and fix this other thing. At the same time, we all love technology, we're wearing like 86 devices right now, and we take everything that's possible with technology and we extrapolate that as well, and then we marry these two extrapolations and they begin to compound into what we like to think as exponential expectations, right? So, and then we go and talk to everyone who's not in this field about everything that is going to be cured and fixed, and they have these exponential expectations. Uh, I'll give you an example. I've been wearing a wearable now. I was on the Fitbit beta, and I am still kind of plateaued at like 8 or 9% body fat. I can't break through that threshold. i uh, waiting for AI to cure cancer. I think every morning I check the news feed. It still hasn't happened. I'm waiting for drone drops from Amazon to my door, bespoke therapies to cure rashes and stuff like that, right? So I can't seem to get this optimism out of my head. So rather than saying that we're in a trough, why don't we refer to this as a state of pre-success? We're almost there. We're going to start to really claw ourselves out of it. So uh, with this infectious enthusiasm that we're always surrounded by at a conference like this and with all our peers and, the, and everyone that we work uh, together with, um, we turn for an opportunity to really uh, outlet and output that optimism and really drag us across this line of success with a lot of the work we do on a day-to-day -day basis. We work with a ton of physicians, we work with a ton of patients, and we really analyze the journey that they go through together and how they kind of intersect and, uh, and interact with each other. Uh, and we stumbled across something really, really interesting. When a physician becomes a patient, they go through this really transformative experience. Uh, now, if you're having trouble visualizing this, I'm a neuroscientist, I can't really picture this. With the magic of Photoshop, picture here that the physician has now become the patient. Um, and if you're sitting there saying, uh, I, I park my ego at the door, I don't suffer from any sort of emotional impact, recognize again through Photoshop that the patient has in fact become the physician. So, Stay alert, anything can happen at any moment in time here, all right? Shit can get real. So, um, this all can be summed up uh, by a quote that we repeatedly see physicians say as a result of going through this journey, is that had I known uh, then what I know now as a result of becoming a patient, I really would have approached care differently. I would have run my practice a little bit differently. My relationship with my patients would have been a little bit different. Not better or worse, just different. I would have listened with a different set of ears. Uh, and I maybe would have explored different therapies uh, in a shorter timeline had I gone through this experience early on in my career. Uh, what's fascinating about this new, uh, the impact of this new sense of deep empathy is that uh, this isn't a new phenomenon. Um, there are myriad articles, books, uh, and blog posts written about this. In fact, something really interesting, uh, Jan and I traveled recently to Africa uh, for some development uh, opportunities. And we came across a number of cultures that almost mandated that in order to become a healer or a medicine man within their culture, they had to have gone through a number of the illnesses that impact their uh, communities in order to sort of qualify as a healer. So that was fast. So this isn't even a new phenomenon. The, the, the stickler with this one, it's kind of interesting, is that it's very difficult to exponentialize this sort of epiphany. I can't tell you that I went through this epiphany and then have you feel this, this deep sense of empathy. So what do we do then to harness the power of empathy? So consider that we've got all this digital medicine at our disposal. Now we have all this technology that can really amp up and power things up. And we have this power of empathy that we know will impact the physician in terms of how they apply care. So uh, this all kind of came together. We're saying, you know, for years people have been saying, you can't really make someone feel someone else's pain. How do we do that? But maybe with everything at our disposal, maybe now we actually can. So that's when I turned to the smartest guy I know on this stage, uh, Jan, and said, uh, I'm just the ideas guy. I think I need you to quickly figure out how to administer as much pain to physicians as quickly as possible. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, do I need to do it ethically? And I was like, it's questionable at this point in time. Uh, but then he said, um, can you, in fact, uh, explore ways to have physicians feel their patients' pain and discomfort? So I tried. Uh, <laughs> How do we, right now, teach people about what it's like to have a disease? How do we teach what it's like to feel pain or to have a condition? We do this two ways right now. We use standard methods, standard educational methods. We use classroom style, watching videos, role play, and the onus is on the student, on the physician or the caregiver to try to imagine what it is like to be that person. We also use technology. 
there's a variety of contraptions that people can wear to experience what it's like to have arthritis, to be geriatric, to have macular degeneration, multiple sclerosis, you name it. There's a lot of devices that can make you feel what it's like to have a disease. But those devices perpetuate the, the notion that the disease is a universal experience, that someone's multiple sclerosis would be the same as someone else, that being geriatric is the same for everyone. So we, we realized that there was a large unmet need in it, the ability to transmit someone's experience, someone's pain, not just pain, somebody's pain to somebody else. Now, this seemed like a pretty interesting idea to explore, but was this clinically relevant? Is this just fun exploration, or does this make sense? It is very clinically relevant. There's a lot of literature that shows that increased empathy is correlated with quality of care. If we can boost empathy in the caregivers, medical or family, the patient would benefit. So this was getting interesting. We had to pick a disease. We had to pick a symptoms, a symptom that we could transfer from someone to a caregiver to see if we can increase empathy. We chose Parkinson. Why did we choose Parkinson disease, specifically the tremors of Parkinson disease? It's for two reasons. The first one is the tremors of Parkinson patients, as you can see here, are visible. They are noticeable. So if we do something to transmit them to somebody else, we can immediately see if it's working because we would see tremors. The second part that's interesting about Parkinson patient and the, their relationship with caregiver is quite often the empathy is not quite complete. There's an empathy deficit. Parkinson patients tend to score low on the empathy scale, and the physicians don't really comprehend the impact that the tremors have on their life. They think it's just shake. They know what it, it's tremor, but you can't really understand it until you have it. So we got to the stage where we had to engineer that. We're going to transmit Parkinson disease tremor to someone. How do we do this? So if we look at our endpoint, and our beginning. We want somebody to have tremor, we start with somebody else having tremor. We need to digitize those tremors, convert them to data, re-inject that data in somebody else. Tremors are shake of the hand, so we could measure accelerometer data and just do essentially a seismograph of the hand, but that's not good enough. That's too crude, that's too coarse. So if we look one level up, what causes the tremors, it's muscles that are pulsing in sequence. So we're going to measure muscle activity, and we use electromyogram to measure what the muscles are doing. Then we do signal analysis on those electromyogram to characterize and identify the tremors. So this is where we find what is a tremor, we measure its length and its intensity, we do spectral analysis to find the frequency of the tremors, and we end up with a, essentially a playlist of tremors over time over a person's arm. Then we need to re-inject that information. I want somebody else's arm to pulse in the same fashion. For this, we use electrical muscle stimulation, essentially tense devices that, as opposed to giving you standard contraction to work your abs while you're eating, they play back what's happening in somebody else's hand. So we got to the stage where we had, a, we had an engineering concept. We need to build it. Our approach to technology in a lab, we work with every kind of technology, so we're not really impressed by the new shiny object. We would pick the, the one that is needed for the job. We call this the minimum viable technology approach. So we're not going to use blockchain or machine learning for something like that. We're going to use Arduino. It's really simple, and it will do the job. This is our proof of concept, our minimum viable technology product, and what it did, lucky, is it proved the concept. It worked. I wouldn't really be here. Uh, and this allowed us to transmit somebody's electromyogram to somebody else. We were now ready to move to the next step, which is build a prototype. A prototype that you see here, called Simples, is much nicer. It doesn't use Arduino anymore. It uses our own circuitry that we built in the office. And this is patent pending, it's been sent to the FDA, this device is approved as an investigational device and currently going to a class 2 um, 510K. This device allows us to now start studying because no digital medicine project is finished until you actually validate that it does what it should do. 
So we ran a series of studies, and uh, it works. The results, this is the example from one study. In seven minutes, we can increase the empathy by 52%. This is in seven minutes, which is amazing, because the traditional way of increasing empathy for people are really difficult. It's super hard to move somebody's empathy state. So I've talked a lot about all of this, and you probably want to say, OK, show me. So we're going to show you what the device is like, just like we show the world. We started being able to talk about it. We're like, hey, we have something we can talk about. We need to name it. What is, what is that thing we just created? And we wrote about it, and we gave it a name. We called it teleempathy. Teleempathy means the transmission, like a telephone, of empathy. This became something we had to name it because there was no concept up to now of transmitting tremor. There was simulation, but there was no transmission. So we're going to show you an actual application of teleempathy on a patient, if my remote continues working, and you'll see it in action. Same age, same, we're going through the same stuff all the time. Same friends. And like to go to the same places and do the same things. When we look back at old photos, we're not sure who's who. Not so much now. It's like not being in control of your own body. It's like something else is controlling you and, and trying, to, trying to keep you from doing what you want to do. <clears throat> I'd like to feel the sensation and try and uh, grapple with sort of everyday tasks and, and see what that's like, what it's like for Jim. Oh. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Do I feel something? Look at my head. Like I have lost complete control of my arm. Yeah, you're looking at me. Exactly. Having felt it, I'm like, I would I would I really kind of I'm not sure how to describe it. It's the first time I've ever seen my tremor in somebody else. I want everyone to be able to feel that. Nurses and neurosurgeons could experience it in almost real time, and I think it will be a game changer for them. Thank you. <laughs> so who really, hands up, who really felt something as a result of seeing that video? Who really, even Beanbag guys here, you, who really felt that deep sense of empathy as a result of that? Yes? No. You did not actually feel empathy. What you felt was sympathy, right? What you saw was Jim's wife, for the first time in their entire relationship, truly being able to feel empathy because she was experiencing what he was experiencing in real time. So, uh, we have now taken all that potential and all that optimism wrapped up in digital medicine, we've created a data stream, we've leveraged technology, and we've moved physicians into a heightened state of empathy as a result of putting them through this experience. People say that physicians lack, lack, lack empathy. Nobody lacks empathy. They need to be moved into a state of empathy by going through an experience. In doing so, we now see an opportunity to improve the quality of care for those patients. So we're always looking for opportunities uh, to kind of amplify the impact of this. So we look for... Um, Conditions that have large populations, so we can apply this a large, across a large data set. We look for that high empathy deficit that Jan had talked about, and we look for a business case that would be the result, the commercial impact of improving that quality of care. So one of the next applications we're working on in our lab is for COPD. COPD scores very high on the empathy deficit. I mean, people call it the smoker's disease. Even the patients themselves have low empathy for their disease. So we are building right now a, uh, a proof of concept, very similar in concept to what we did for Parkinson. This is what they look like right now. Um, we use a, um, a device that uses ultrasound to measure the airflow on a patient so that we have absolutely no restriction on their breathing because the last thing we want to do is affect the patient's breathing. And then on the caregiver, we use a series of mechanical valves that limit your breathing to what the patient receives. So when a patient takes a small, short breath and it can only get a liter of air, you only get a liter of air. 
We use pulse oximetry to check the oxygen level and people desaturate really quickly with that. It's terribly unpleasant to try, but it gives you the, the sensation of what it's like to be that patient. It's not like breathing through a straw that mimics what it's like to not be able to breathe very well. This is someone's experience. Uh, other high empathy deficit spaces we're looking at are in the GI area with, I, um, with IBD. A lot of folks just sort of who have never experienced this liken this to like a funny tummy and why can't you just sort of soldier through it? But it is debilitating. Uh, certainly a, a huge population with diabetes. Um, we'll be looking at uncontrolled diabetes and a peripheral neuropathy of some sort and the impact of that and having a physician feel that. And of course, th the largest one really that we've come across, we're still early in terms of considering how we would have someone else feel someone's depression as opposed to just sort of, why don't you turn that frown upside down and shake it off. Uh, so uh, with that, we feel really great about the opportunity to, to drag us from a state of pre-success to success, uh, so much so that we've got something special for you. Yeah. So we, we sort of closed the loop, we got out of the trough by finding an unmet need, making sure it was clinically relevant, and validating the result. It's as simple as that. You'll notice there's no mention of technology. The technology is not important. This is what's important. Um, you're probably eager to try the device, so we actually have it in demo in the innovation lab. So please come see us, and you would be able to experience Jim's tremor. The tremors you saw in a video, we have them recorded on a device, and you can experience that for yourself, and quite likely feel more empathy for Jim. Thank you very much.